So now we're in the basement of the same building where you think it's just upstairs as offices and, start from there. and manufacturing. But. And so this, this building was here when you chose to move into it. It was just completed. It was a brand new building. And I rented uh, one floor uh, for the offices and the basement for the, it was for warehouses that we converted into a workshop here. And they bring the raw materials, the aluminum. The aluminum arrives in sheets that are foiled and calibrated to a particular thickness. For instance, you can see where we were cutting the platters. Right. Those are, those are turntable platters? Yes. Okay. And this is our 5-axis uh, water jet, which does the cutting. It's an American machine made by a company called Omax. The beauty of the machine is that it actually has a tilting head, so we can compensate for tougher, because when you're cutting, uh, the deflects the cutting stream, and uh, the surfaces are not perpendicular. Here on this machine, we can compensate for that. It must be very noisy when that thing is running. And the uh, water comes out at the supersonic speed, so that's even noisier, yeah. the nozzle. You usually operate it with the nozzle submerged. And this? This is a flat grinder so that you can get the panels <coughs> that are cut. They go through this machine which has two grinding belts and a brush on the back to give you the finish on the flat panels. After, after it's machined? After it's cut, it yeah, goes here to get you the brushed finish. Okay. And a bit blasting for cleaning the smaller part. Right. Getting the satin finish on the front panels. Oh, so you get a big sheet of, oh, sheet of glass and then you cut out the pieces you need. wasn't in this stuff. Nah, this so you, had to learn all, you had to learn all this yeah. stuff where you found I, people. I was sitting on the beach uh, reading a book and the book I was reading was Surface Treatment and Processing of Aluminum Alloys. I read that myself. It's fantastic. Yeah. The sex scenes are insane. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So people were really looking strange at me. This is the multi-bank facility. They actually started dropping some of my This is where all the stainless steel and other bits are done. They are my neighbors. And, uh, because we process only aluminum in my facility. Right. This is our uh, warehouse for finished product and for materials and for my other activities. suspension system for the iron bore mounting. Oh, the this is oh, the produced from a round uh, bar stock. It's uh, milled, then it does all the threads, holes, 
when it comes out of ready, this goes into the anodizing and it's done. It's programming some other parts. Recycled and pumped through the nozzle there. And this is the compressors that keep up the air supply. This is a, it's a unit extraction system that keeps up the air clean. And so this is what this is the thing that you, you, you see all this. And that that's when you, you read these idiots online saying, I know the parts cost of what that costs. Yeah. They don't understand what goes into it. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, 400,000 euro machine. Right. It weighs 12 tons. We actually get to demolish the wall to get them in. Wow. And rebuild the wall. Wow. You're looking at uh, over a million euro worth of machinery. Yeah. This is how the parts come in from uh, the water jet. So the flat sheet would go in there, then they will be cut to size for the different things that we're going to make. And each one of those plates goes to the corresponding machine and it's converted into a part for the... This is the tops for the amplifiers. And that's all scrap down there. And this is scrap parts. The cost is so beautiful. So inside there are magnets that uh, provide the anti-skating. You see when, with this thing. No, mm. yeah. This thing has an embedded magnet and there are magnets also on the inside. Anti-skating force. So as you can see, this thing locks into a certain position. Right. And if I rotate this, it follows. They adjust the anti-skating range within the range of the grooves of the... By turning that. And as soon as you go out, you have no anti-skating. Interesting. That's really... You don't see the mechanism, but it's all built in. And the, the um, distance between the magnets defines the... Sure, the force. force. Yeah. 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 Then the bearing, the horizontal bearing, is low. It's here. The vertical bearing is here on top, but actually... This is the vertical bearing, so it's at the, at the same position as the needle, at the right. level of the record. Yeah. So when the tone arm moves up and down on a warped record, the vertical tracking force doesn't change because the counterweight sinks underneath the bearing and it also changes the weight proportion accordingly. And also the uh, different arm ones, different lengths, 9 inch and uh, 11 inch. 282 and 239 millimeters. And this is made out of? This is ebony. Wood. And, and who machines this? A uh, local luthier. That makes uh, musical instruments. And we got them to make their own ones for us. 
And is that wood seasoned anyway, or is it? Oh uh, yeah, it's musical instruments. It's usually yeah. so all it's the same wood that he would use for the carbon fiber. So it's a few different diameters of carbon fiber tubes that are stuck together in order to get the. This is light and strong. Yeah. This one is unidirectional. So the carbon fibers run only in one direction. Right. So this thing is very stiff in one direction and super brittle in, in the other. And the combination of uh, those creates a composite structure that we dump internally with some aluminum. So parts. this thinner, thinner diameter goes right. inside that. And then do you, you, what do you put in between those two? They, they just sit, sit in there together? Yeah, and they sit in there together and there is uh, some glue and another damping uh, in compound. Between. Yeah, yeah. And there is then Teflon tubing because this is conductive. Uh, so it prevents the build-up of static right. or anything. But we need a Teflon tubing to insulate the internal wires right. in case this creates any potential. Yeah. So How many parts go inside one of those? Look, look, so ask, ask, like him whether, ask him whether mm -hmm. 20 years ago he imagined he'd be sitting building tone arms for record players. He's been fixing turntables since a kid. So oh. He's always been into that, but never imagined that uh, he would actually be making anything. Especially now. <laughs> So rubber. That is this part. Is this? No. This. Oh, I see. Through there, I see. Yes. I see. And that's the cap. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. And that's the fi that's the fi fine adjustment. Yes, okay. fine. Right. Fine adjustment. Okay. Yes. This is Byron.
And just like that, you have a tone on. the glass that you saw it was cut uh, downstairs. So we yeah. send it to a facility that um, tempers it. So it's tempered glass. Once it makes it back, it's mounted in the front panel. And then the front panel, together with the sides, is assembled into the main frame. Where we mount the suspension system. Right. This is where the minus K is mounted. So when assembled, it looks like this. This is prior to mounting the minus K. So the okay, so this is the you're showing us the bear the bearing system now. So this is the bearing of the turntable. Uh, it's a machine from steel. It's uh, hardened then with uh, inductive uh, ovens and then they put it on a special grinding machine that produces a tolerance of 5 microns. So it's actually quite precise, so there is absolutely no movement whatsoever. And this thing supports the bowl. So there's a ball inside a of there. A ceramic bowl bearing, yeah. Okay. And we assemble the platter around this. And that attaches to in, inside yeah, the to chassis. To different parts of the platter, it's a yeah. compound platter from multiple parts, and they attach to the to this. We'll pull the platter now, and okay, we can have a look. So there's the, there's the, the bearing the in bearing. place. It's embedded yeah. in the platter. The ceramic bow is inside. It's a... Uh, I don't know if you can see it there. Yeah, could, could yeah. actually. Yeah. And this is the platter system. Inside there is also a lead shot. And, uh, and this is, how is this is bonded to? Uh, this is a special um, a material that we buy from the car industry. It's... Uh, Rubber with uh, fibers for damping to give us more or less the same impedance as uh, vinyl. And that's that you would hear, hear that a thin little surface to this, yes, which is that's an uh, uh, this is a, pl uh, con a composite plastic, yeah, and then it's a uh, aluminum base. So this is this is two pieces here, right? yeah, yeah, okay. And the way that they interconnect it actually isolates the noise from the belts getting into the platter. And how difficult is it to pull the the well, there is a special the tool. Yeah, there's a little tool to pull yeah, it out. To okay. It. okay. So this goes right inside yes. the turntable. And it's, it's a leaf spring based thing? Or this looks like it's got a coil spring. Uh, the coil springs are compensating the force for the weight, but actually that, the effect is done from the leaf springs. You're just pushing them together to define the force at which they would collapse. The idea is to use the collapse spring yep. effect. And this is invented by a very smart man. Uh, those guys are geniuses. Yeah. The motor is in place at that point. Yeah. Motor is in place. It's wired to the back. Yeah. And uh, what does this weigh at this point in time? This uh, is pretty 40, heavy. Forty-five kilos. 
45 kilos, well, it's very heavy. Uh, all the aluminum parts are anodized downstairs, only the stainless steel parts are actually outsourced to another laser cutting facility. Mm. And then the controller and table are put together. We put in the serial tier number and then we do the speed check. For the speed check we use two different tools. One that you're familiar with. Yes. And also the laser tachograph from uh, Sutherland. And now? Then the speed is programmed. Uh, depending on the ratio between the pulley and the platter and the thickness and batch of the belts. Usually from when we boot it up, it's within half per percent, and we just need to adjust it specifically. Now, is it, can the user at home adjust the speed too, or no, or is it? In theory, yes, in practice we avoid them yeah. to do that, because most people will set it wrong. They have really crappy tools. Yeah. And we and prefer to guarantee that. If the belt has to be changed, then you'd have to really reset the speed though. Yeah. So who does that? It's done with a USB interface on the back of the controller. You connect your PC and you just change the number. It's a four-digit number, so we're adjusting it within one um, thousandth of the RPM. And so that's something you don't want the end user to deal with until he needs to, and then yeah. you would tell him. If you... he needs to replace the belts, there is a reason for it, so it's better for somebody to actually check it and see what's happening. Right. Okay. We provide the tool to the dealers and show them how to do that. I see. And that's why it's important to have a dealer network when you sell a product like this. It needs yeah. a support because, yeah. uh, as you know, you have to adjust the floating of the ton arms. You have to adjust the floating of the minus K. It makes a 120-pound table feel like a couple hundred grams. Everything needs a bit of service. At the moment, it's too late right. because it doesn't have a record on top of it. Right. And as soon as we put a record in, and it's that sensitive that a record does it matter how heavy the record is if it's if it's a 180 gram or a 120 gram? Is <laughs> well, <laughs> shouldn't. It, you can feel that there is slight differences between the weight of the records. Yeah. Still. And then you have it. There's a knob in the back. It's just like the one I've got on mine. This one will be mounted with a second ton arm. I'll get the guy to move the Kuzma right. Right. on this one so that you can have two ton arms. Now, when you have when you have a something like a big heavy Kuzma on one side and this on the other side, how do you ba how do you balance it so that it's level? It's actually quite strong. The suspension system is 16 kilos of uh, pull force, so. It shouldn't make much of a difference, and those things can be made in uh, aluminum or brass to compensate for the weight oh, difference. Okay. So when we get the order for the different arm boards, we can anticipate what's going to happen. Okay, so if a customer decides to change his, his tone arm and calls the dealer, and the dealer says, I need another, tone, another arm board, and then contacts you, mm -hmm. how long can you turn it around and get it to him? If it's something that we've done, Two days. If it's something new, we need to produce a new model of the armboard, machine it, anodize it, and send it. But it's quite quick because it's all done here. Yeah. And um, you keep a database of tone arm? Yeah. Well, when now we've done Kuzmas, we've done SMEs, SAT, and different lengths of shredders, and we're doing an Ikeda now. And this this is where you, you put your spare needles, like when you change needle. And <laughs> Just decoration. I know. I know. I know.